Cool. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name's Phil. Uh, I'm an Android developer at uh, Shopify, and uh, yeah, I'm just uh, going to talk uh, today about uh, architecture components. Um, as the title says, uh, I wrote an app that um, just uses them are exclusively. So uh, I'm just going to sort of share um, the experiences I had, how the the uh, the pros I found, the the gotchas that I found, basically anything that anything I found that I'm going to pass along. So, uh, no matter you know wherever I am, whether it be on you know the TTC or out for dinner or just walking down the street, inevitably people are stopping me and asking me this question right here. So uh, I'm just going to set the record straight. Um, so why did I write this app? A uh, couple reasons. One is I wanted to use architecture components, and I wanted to use it. Um, I wanted to use them in a way that not just sort of retrofitting it into an existing app that sort of piece by piece. Um, I wanted to sort of write an app that was, <clears throat> from the beginning, designed to use architecture components. Um, I also sort of wanted to use them in a, in a, as well in a real world situation. So a lot of the tutorials that you'll read and, and, and blog posts and stuff, you know, they always kind of have like just a simple little, you know, one sort of screen app or something that um, looks really cool, but then if you actually, sometimes you go and try to actually use it and you find like a bunch of issues that don't come up with uh, the situations when you're just using sort of a small little app. So I wanted to see how it worked in a, in a real world situation. And uh, finally is I wanted to uh, do more Kotlin. So this app is written, uh, um, yeah, it's 100% in Kotlin. So um, if you like Kotlin, that's great. If not, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, so just sort of the, the basics of, of what, uh, what I'm going to still be talking about. Um, I just, the app I wrote was pretty simple. It's just sort of a, a reminders app. So, um, I mean, you basically, you know, you sort of give it, uh, you can set a reminder on your phone, you know, you give it, uh, you know, a time, a date, uh, you know, recurrence, what you want the reminder to say. And then whenever the reminder triggers, it sends a notification to your phone. So um, nothing too exciting, but it's, you know, sort of a simple, um, simple sort of application. Um, and in order to do this, um, Right, talked about that. Uh, in order to do this, uh, I did a few different things. So um, I used a, an, MVV, an MVVM architecture um, using the view models component of the architecture components. Um, I used <clears throat> uh, for all sort of all the I guess views of the app. So the activities and fragments um, are observing live data in order to know when to update the UI. And in order for any sort of local persistence, uh, I'm using root, which has Eric mentioned is uh, just sort of a, a, an abstraction over the top of SQLite. Um, <clears throat> just to get an idea, um, so who here, I'm assuming most of you do, but have you, I guess we all sort of, has everyone sort of heard of architecture components and sort of know what they are? Cool. Um, so yeah, so for the most part, I mean, this isn't, this isn't going to be much of, it's not going to be much of a tutorial. It's going to be more in the sense of um, going over how I use them, the, the experience that I found, and uh, sort of how I made them work together. So um, hopefully it gives you an idea as to sort of what it's like to use them in a, in a real world situation. So just a disclaimer, this is probably the best advice you will ever get, both in Android and in life. Um, but you gen generally speaking, um, the reason I'm saying this is uh, I'm definitely not an expert when it comes to architecture components. Um, and so I guess the whole, sorry. Um, definitely not an expert when it comes to architecture components, but um, I guess the um, as I, I sort of you know I had experience using them in, in other apps, but for the most part, uh, this whole thing was definitely a learning experience, and um, a lot of what I learned was from the documentation and some uh, some really good samples on uh, there's a, a GitHub repo that Google's put out um, for architecture components, so that gives a lot of good examples on how to use them. So. <clears throat> um, so I guess I should sort of re rephrase this by saying, don't only listen to me. So a lot of the things that I say hopefully will be helpful for you, and um, you'll be able to use them in your projects. But there's definitely lots of great resources um, out there as well uh, for any, any of the gaps that might be missing. And um, if you happen to see, uh, there's going to be some code in here. And if you happen to see anything that um, maybe looks funny to you, or, or maybe you've had experience doing something in a different way that you feel might be better, uh, by all means, please tell me because um, I'm I'm learning this as well. So um, yeah, I'd love to hear if you 
have a suggestion or if you uh, think I could be doing something better. So just to sort of give you an idea as to, as to sort of how the app sort of ties together, um, we've got, um, you know, we've got our sort of basic activities and fragments. Um, the app is pretty simple. It's just sort of got a list of reminders and, and a way to, to sort of add the deep or to create a new reminder. Um, and each one of these activities or fragments uh, has a view model associated with it. So uh, this is a view model coming from the architecture components library. Um, and the whole purpose of a view model is it's got a few different purposes. Um, it exposes the any data that the view needs to the view or to the view, so that's where it gets it. Uh, the view model can hold any state that you need to for the view for um, things you might want to re recreate on sort of a, on a config change. And uh, it also allows to react to user input. So if I go ahead and press that, you know, for example, the the add reminder button in the bottom right corner, um, that's going to call a method in the view model saying add reminder, and then the view model knows to go about going to add a reminder. So the view model and the view sort of talk back and forth to each other, either through uh, live data to expose um, to expose the data that you're looking for, or the, and then the, the view can talk back to the view model by calling uh, any exposed methods on the view model. And the view model in turn, in order to get the data that it's looking for, um, is talking to room, um, which is just a sort of a, an abstraction over SQLite. Um, so you don't have to use the SQLite APIs that have been around with since Android one, which or level one, which um, I hope no one is still using those. <laughs> if you are, maybe you should leave. Um, just kidding, not really. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, yeah, so that's essentially just sort of um, just sort of a, I guess, just an overall sort of view of how this app is going to look. So I'm going to go through sort of each each uh, each of the uh, components piece by piece that I used. Uh, we've got view models, we have room, and we have live data. So starting with view model uh, or with view models, there's an awful lot of code on here, but I'll just kind of go through it uh, piece by piece here. So this is this is a snippet of the uh, the view model that's associated with the main activity. And so the main activity in this case is um, is the list of reminders. So it's all the reminders that you have set that are going to be um, that are, that are upcoming um, that, uh, that you've set. So up at the top here, um, we have a group of live data objects. And what these, the, the role of these is to, um, these are exposed to the view and the view can observe or subscribe to them. And um, this is how the communication is done between say the view model and is pushing data from the view model to the view. So uh, if we look at the very top, we've got the first one is, is a, a reminder list which is um, essentially a list of reminders wrapped in a, a live data object um, and uh, and a subscriber such as the, the view or the activity can subscribe to that list of reminders and every time that list of reminders is updated or retrieved from the database then the uh, the data from the database gets pushed to the view and the view can update the view accordingly by putting um, you know the list of reminders in the recycler view for example um, we've also got a couple of other ones, um, which are of type mutable live data, which is a subclass of live data, which where you can actually change the, the value of the live data object yourself. So live data is not technically mutable, but or immutable, but it's you can't actually change the value. So it's um, in this case, it's getting the list of reminders from the database, um, but you couldn't go in and, and change that list if you wanted. Mutable live data, you can. So mutable live data works well for live data that you want to be able to control and push to your to your view. Um, and so in this case, I'm, I've got a couple of live uh, mutable live data that I'm using to control the visibility of a couple of views on the on the screen. Uh, below there, we have a few other um, uh, we have a few single live events. And what single live events are are they're uh, they're also a subclass of of live data. Um, However, uh, what those are meant for is, it's almost like a, an event on an event bus. So if you've ever used an event bus, you, you push an event out and all the subscribers, you know, uh, catch that event. That's essentially what single live event is. It's so these are really good for things like um, one-time UI updates. So showing a toast, for example, or showing a confirmation dialogue. These work really well for those because it's, 
it's sort of one event that you're just sort of pushing to the to the view and say, hey, um, show this toast or show this snack bar or something like that. Um, one little gotcha about single live event um, is that it's not actually included in the in the when you download the, or when you include the architecture components dependencies from Google, it's not actually included. Um, it's which I don't know why, uh, but anyway, um, it's it's actually used, but it's used quite predominantly in the samples on the Google GitHub repo. And uh, from what I understand, um, from what I understand, it's coming in future versions. It will be included in future versions of the library, but it didn't make for the 1.0 release for whatever reason. Um, and then sort of moving on sort of down, um, we just have a couple of accessor methods for some of the mutable live data objects. This isn't necessarily required, um, but it's if you love mutability, then, or uh, if you love ensuring mutability, sorry, that should say immutability. Um, anyway, uh, if you uh, don't want any um, consumers of these things to go and change your data, then um, these accessor methods essentially just expose the, the live data component of the mutable live data so that you can subscribe to it, but uh, you can't actually go and change any of the data, which is um, you know probably a good practice. And then down below we have uh, sort of exposed methods that the view can call when reacting to user input. So if I click the delete all reminders button on the on the main activity, um, it's going to go ahead and call this method right here. And then the view model is going to go ahead and actually actually do the action of deleting all the reminders from the database. So that was, that's, uh, I know it's quite a bit of code there, but that's generally um, essentially sort of the, the role of the, uh, of the view model. Um, one thing to sort of notice is that up at the top, you'll see that uh, the view model has a couple of constructor parameters. Um, if you've ever, if, if you've used a view model before, um, typically you don't instantiate a view model by uh, creating an instance of the class. So um, in order to, in order to get uh, those constructor or those parameters into the constructor, um, you can use or you create uh, an implementation of, of a view model provider factory interface, which is sort of up here. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to instantiate the view model in um, using the framework, which is, um, which is the way you should be instantiating it for a number of reasons. Um, but it also allows you to pass in constructor parameters um, to the view. So if a, 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 I guess a comparison is if with fragments, you know, you, a fragment always has to have a, an empty constructor, for example. So in order to pass data into the fragment, people came up with a new instance paradigm where you'd have a sort of a static new instance method and, and pass your parameters in there uh, when creating the fragment. Um, and so this is a sort of a similar sort of idea. You're, you're creating a, this is the way to create sort of a view model using, um, in order to pass in your own parameters in the constructor. And then when it's a matter of actually going to instantiate the view model, um, you can use this, uh, this sort of declaration at the bottom here where you've got a view model providers of um, method call where you provide it uh, the view model factory that you've just created up there. Um, in the instance where you don't have any, you don't need to pass any uh, parameters into the constructor, then you just don't include that. So this method will work just fine if that parameter, if that view matter or the view model factory parameter is omitted. So um, that's sort of just sort of general speaking how the uh, main activity view model and, and how it's created and instantiated. How about uh, if, how would we want to test, uh, test a view model? Turns out testing is really, really easy. Um, one of the reasons for using view models is that they allow you to um, make your code extremely testable because view models are all done with um, just JVM tests. So uh, this is um, essentially you just, you create your view model and I know I just went on about how you don't create it by just calling the constructor directly, but in the testing situation it's okay to do that because you're not relying on the framework in order to instantiate it. So it's basically just a matter of, mod a matter of creating your view model and then calling your you know, whatever test method you want to test and then doing your assertions and all that kind of stuff. It's super easy to test. It's a great way to get your testable logic outside of a fragment or activity and into something else that can be tested on with a JVM test as opposed to <clears throat> espresso or anything like that. 
So um, I know I've sort of been, that's a lot, uh, I've been rambling on quite a bit about view models, but um, it's just sort of a, just a sneak peek as sort of how I implemented this in the app. And just as a bit of, a bit of a sort of a summary as, as to how I found working with these, um, there's a lot of really good pros to using view models. The, the biggest one is that they're lifecycle aware, which is amazing. So I mentioned earlier that you don't necessarily instantiate a view model by calling the constructor directly. And instead you use that view model providers.of method. And that is because um, Android manages these view models when you create them. So if I create a view model for the main activity and then I rotate my device, um, I'm sure we all know that activity is going to get destroyed. Um, when it gets recreated, it will actually get that same view model it had from where it had previously when it was in its previous state. And so that view model persists the config change and is re-added to, to the new activity. And as far as the view model, as far as the activity cares, it's, it's the same view model. As far as the view model cares, it's the same activity. Everything just works really well, which if, you know, if, 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 if you've been doing Android, you know that's a huge problem. It's that it can be a huge problem on rotation that you lose all your data and you have to put stuff in the save instance state bundle or if you have async tasks that blow up and all sorts of bad things. So this, um, this, this solves a lot of problems in that regard, which is fantastic. Um, and, uh, well, I guess I just talked about uh, the persistent config changes. Um, but uh, another, another important point um, with these two right here is that uh, sort of um, going back, I guess, for example, to the async task model, um, I'm sure we've all done this. If you sort of start an async task and then you ro rotate your device, um, when the async task finishes, it tries to do something in the previous activity and it crashes and everything's bad. So, or if you're using Rx Java, for example, you might want to keep track of your subscription and then cancel it when the, when the activity is destroyed. With uh, view models, you don't have to do that, which is really nice. So if the view model triggers a, um, you know, a network call, for example, and then the device is rotated, um, when the view model, if the, view, if, the, if the app is, let's say the app, you, say you leave the app, for example, um, then the view model will know that your activity no longer exists. And when the network call is done, it won't try and, and call any methods on your activity. And uh, so, so you, won't, uh, you won't run into that same problem. And as well, um, uh, sorry, I slipped my mind, but, um, but yeah, so it won't, uh, it won't try and do that. And as well, if you rotate the device, when the network, um, when the network call is finished, it will actually, uh, all the, the data will actually be delivered to your new activity, um, the one that's been recreated on the, on the rotation. Um, so it's actually, th these two features right here are extremely handy because it solves a lot of things that Android developers have been dealing with for a number of years. And finally, it's got really easy JVM tests. It it's, makes testing really easy and um, really, really handy. Um, some gotchas, some things to be aware of. Uh, these aren't necessarily cons uh, to using um, view models or any of the other components, but just things to be aware of. If, as I mentioned, if you need constructor parameters, you want to um, you want to implement this view model provider factory interface as opposed to um, instantiating anything correctly. So, just something to be aware of when you're uh, when you're using this. But that's really about it. That was the only sort of gotcha that I found when I was using um, view models in this in this regard. So, on the whole, if if you were saying like, hey, should I be using view models? Um, I would say, yeah, go for it. Um, it's, it's, they solve a lot of problems and there's a lot of benefits to them. Um, it's, it's a nice way to actually have a platform recommended architecture as well. Um, view models obviously go well with MVVM and yeah, we've never had a platform recommended architecture. Um, it's always something that developers have sort of had to come up with themselves. So it's great in that regard as well. Um, if you have an architecture that you're happy with and you don't necessarily want to switch, then that's totally cool. Um, not that you need my permission or anything, but um, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, your, your app's not going to stop working if you don't use um, an MVVM or uh, architecture or view models. Um, but it's just, if you're looking for a new architecture or you don't have an architecture and, you're, and it's something you, I would definitely recommend considering.
So uh, moving on to room. So uh, room is going to be used, room I use for all the data persistence in the app. So um, whenever you create a reminder, it gets saved to the database. Um, and that's uh, every time you edit one or delete anything like that, it's all done through, through room. So uh, in order to use room, uh, the first thing I needed to do was create um, basically a model for a reminder that I'm going to save. <clears throat> it's essentially, uh, it's very, it's basically just a, a model class that I'm sure we're all familiar with, with just a few extra little things tossed in. Um, in order for it to work with room, you need to annotate it with this uh, entity annotation and tell it what, what table you want to store it in in the database. Um, you then have your sort of your properties that you use uh, for the um, for the reminder. So in my case, I've got title, body, time, recurrence, and you know some other sort of uh, other little features I needed or other little properties I needed. And excuse me, we also have uh, the ID for the uh, for the reminder, which is annotated with primary key, which means that um, that's going to be the primary key for that uh, for that object in the database. Um, so pretty simple. I mean, it's just sort of uh, basically just a, a model class with some annotations thrown in. One little thing that if, uh, if you love immutability, one little thing you may notice is that these are all bars instead of vowels, which means that these can be changed. Um, and they can also, they're exposing public setters. And this is actually a requirement of room. So in order for any room entity that you're going to use, you're going to need to have public getters and setters, which um, it's, it's not the end of the world, it's just that something you have to deal with if you're using room, but it's just something to be aware of, that um, you gotta be, you got to use that. Um, and so if, the, so we've got our, so now we've got our, our reminder, um, and we're now going to actually write the methods to do the actual database operations. And so that's, in order to do that, it was fairly simple. Um, it was just a matter of creating an interface um, and listing a bunch of listing all the methods that we want to, to use. Um, so we've got you know sort of our, our basic ones like insert, update, and delete uh, for any specific reminder. And all you need to do for those is annotate with them them with insert, update, or delete. And Room is smart enough to know exactly what you're trying to do. So if you, um, for example, if you're trying to delete a reminder and you give it a reminder object annotate with this delete method, it's going to know which reminder to delete based on how you set up the, the uh, reminder model in the previous slide. For anything, that, uh, anything that's more advanced, you are going to have to write your own uh, SQL query, but it's also fairly simple, fairly straightforward. It's, you've got the same sort of thing. You've got your method. You've got your uh, any parameters you need, and you just sort of include the, the specific SQL statement in the query annotation. Um, and yeah, and then when you actually go to use them, it'll, it'll know what to do based on what's in the query. And sort of one final little step, uh, you just need to sort of create an instance of your database, um, which is sort of is done down here. That's sort of how that works. Not super important for, the, um, for this talk, but just to give you a full picture of what you need to do in order to set up a room database. So um, that's all sort of how you all set it up. And again, how about, how about testing? So um, again, testing with Room is also fairly, fairly simple. Um, these are Android JNA tests, so they do require a device or an emulator, um, which again, not a big deal, but just something to be aware of. And it's really quite simple. It's, it's um, when you start test, you can create uh, an in-memory version of your database. So it's not actually using the database on your device or, or part of your app. It creates one for the purpose of the test. And then when the test is complete, then it, it gets wiped and it's gone. And um, then it's just a matter of writing your actual test methods. So in this case, I'm, I just in, you know, I answered a few reminders into my database. And then I tried to get one specifically based on that ID and just verified that I got the correct one back from the database. Um, one little thing that you will, uh, that you should, that I would like to point out is that when you create your database, there is this allow main thread queries method that you call. And this is because Room does not let you do database operations on the main thread, which is a good thing. Um, but it is something to be aware of. So if you are using Room, um, you will need to handle the threading on your own. 
Uh, so for things like when you're inserting a reminder, um, that, that uh, interface method looked amazing, and it was just like, okay, I'm just gonna call that method, insert reminder, pass it the reminder, and I was really excited when I was doing this, and then I ran it and it crashed. And the first thing it said is you can't, it's like get this off the main thread, like why are you doing that? So um, for testing, you can, it's easy to just add this allow main thread uh, queries um, method when you're creating the database. But in actual production, um, it's definitely not recommended that you do this, so you will have to implement threading on your own. One further gotcha to that is you do not have to implement threading on your own if, you, if the database method is returning a live data object. So if, for example, you're, you're calling the, the database method that says um, you know, get list of reminders, um, that returns a live data object of list of reminders, that you actually don't need to do threading for because uh, Android and Room are smart enough that it knows what you're trying to do. It's your, you're trying to get data and then observe it on, you know, and update the UI so it handles the threading for you. <clears throat> so, uh, when dealing with Room, um, the pros, uh, well, there's writing, there's no more SQL and no more using the SQL API from level one, which, or API level one, which is just horrendous. No more content values, no more, um, uh, cursors, things like that. Um, you do have to write queries, like if, if you need to, but not a huge deal. Um, the testing's fairly easy. Uh, the only, uh, just a couple little gotchas. Uh, you need an emulator, you have to create the in-room or the in-memory database, but fairly simple, but just things to be aware of. And uh, the nice thing about Room is it works well with live data or RxJava. So if you're an RxJava junkie, then you don't have to return a live data object, you can actually return a, a flowable of um, of your return type, and so, um, which is really handy if, uh, if that's sort of your thing. Um, some gotchas about Room. Uh, one is, as I mentioned, you do require an emulator for testing. Um, the, the entities do require public headers and setters, which um, can be annoying, and you do have to handle threading yourself, as I mentioned, unless you're subscribing to live data. So, uh, should you use Room? So this is a bit of a cop-out, but the answer is it kind of depends, So, in my opinion at least. So if you have an ORM that you're happy with, like Realm or ORM Lite or anything else, um, it's really not essential. Um, if it works well for you, then that's, that's cool. Um, if you are still using, I, I know I'm really, I'm really hating on uh, the SQLite API for uh, Android, but if you're still using that, then I definitely recommend trying this because it's a lot easier. It's gonna save you a lot of frustrations and boilerplate code. Um, but it's, uh, and it's, it's really nice because um, another little handy thing is if you are, um, for example, as I mentioned, if you get the, the list of reminders from the database um, and you have a, say, a list view that's subscribing to that list of reminders, if that list of reminders is updated in the database, Room will automatically push the updates to your live data object, which is fantastic. So no more, um, having to re-query the database to get new data, um, and then manually doing all this code to update your list, um, you, the live data object will be delivered the new data, and you set it up in your activity to already update the list when it gets data, so you actually don't have to do anything um, for updates, which is really, really nice. Um, which, and so, if, so really, really handy if, if you're looking for sort of a persist, data persistence sort of strategy. And so yeah, moving on, I guess to the last part um, is live data. So as I've been mentioning, um, live data just, I probably should have mentioned in the beginning, but it's essentially just a wrapper around um, whatever object you have that allows it to be observed. So, um, so in this case, we're now looking at a, a bit of a snippet from the reminder view model, which is the view model for the reminder detail activity. So this would be the activity where you're um, either creating or editing a reminder. And it's, um, <clears throat> it's quite simple. It's, we've just got um, you know, the reminder that's coming from the database. It's, uh, it's of type live data of type reminder. And we've got a few sort of, again, some single live events that I was mentioning earlier on. But the reminder activity, all it has to do is down here is uh, get a reference to the reminder and call the observe method, provide an observer, and that's really it. So <clears throat> all you're doing is you're basically telling uh, Android that anytime, or the live data, that anytime this updates, uh, this method is gonna get called, 
and you're going to do these actions. So in my case, I'm setting the title, setting the body, the time, the date, and, and any recurrence, if the reminder has recurrence. So, um, and as I mentioned, when, if this reminder happens to be updated, um, either in the database or uh, by some other method, this method will automatically get called by the live data object because the live data object knows that when it changes, it's got to call its, all its observers. So really, really handy. It's, you basically are just able to write this code once and then it's just going to get called anytime this, the backing data changes, which is, which is super. So if you've been paying attention, obviously you know that testing is coming up next. Um, and testing, turns out, um, is pretty simple as well. So uh, let's go back to, this was the, the previous uh, test method that we were looking at uh, from the room tests, which is essentially testing the get reminder by ID call. Um, you'll notice down here that, uh, right down here, we're, we're actually you know, sort of getting, the, we've, we add some reminders to the database, and then we're getting, we're trying to find that specific one to make sure the call works. One little thing to be aware of is you'll see that there's this live data test util dot get value call. Um, what that does is it actually returns the value of, so what the uh, DAO dot get reminder by ID method will return a live data object of type reminder um, that you would observe to normally. What this does is actually just pulls the data right, or it pulls the value from that method call right away so that you don't have to do any sort of observing or anything like that. And once again, in true Google fashion, this is not included in the, um, in the library for some reason. Um, but again, it's used in the Google samples quite exclusively. And <clears throat> if, you, if you Google test live data, this is the first thing that comes up. And there's a like five stack overflow posts point, pointing to the Google samples saying to use this. So um, just again, something you'll have to import into your project yourself, but um, just so you're aware it's, it exists. And, and I'm sure it will make its way into the library at some point, but it's just not quite there yet. So, uh, when dealing with uh, live data, so the pros, um, really, really simple to implement. Um, live data is just a really simple wrapper around whatever object you happen to have, um, and you basically just observe it. Oops. Um, the data is automatically updated, or live data automatically calls your observers whenever the backing data is changed, which is also really handy. And it's also got a much lower learning curve than RxJava, so it provides similar functionality in, in, in terms of um, observing, but it's a lot, it's, um, it's, it's a, lot, just a lot simpler to use. It's, it's much more lightweight. You don't get all the baggage that comes with RxJava. Some things to just be aware of. Um, Single live event uh, for one-time updates. As I mentioned a few slides back, uh, any sort of, um, instead of using a live data for events that you just want to be sent once, uh, you can use single live event, which as I mentioned is subclass of live data. Um, the, uh, when you, if you're dealing with immutable live data, it's probably a good idea to, to create a getter for them that just exposes the live data so that you can't go ahead and change, uh, so someone malicious, maliciously can't go and change your data. Um, and conversely, it's live data are limited compared to RxJava. So uh, I'm certainly not an RxJava expert, but if, if you like all the things that come along with it, you're not gonna, if you're using live data, you won't have that stuff. So um, just sort of depends on, on your use case and what you're using. And speaking of RxJava, I mentioned that um, you can replace live data with RxJava. So let's sort of take, let's take a look at what that might look like. So. Um, we, we sort of, we're, we're back to our, um, our database, um, our database uh, interface implementation where this method, all it's doing is, is just getting all the reminders in the database um, that are past a certain time. And you'll notice that it's returning um, a live data object containing a list of reminders. We wanted to do that with RxJava. All we have to do is change the return type, which is really, really cool. Um, you don't have to do anything else, like room understands what you're trying to do, and it will now return the object in a, in a flowable instead of a live data. And when it comes to actually subscribing to this, so here we've got, um, we're subscribing to the live data returned by that method call. Um, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of calling the reminder list, 
calling the observe method and providing an observer. If we're going to use Rx Java for this, it's we essentially get rid of that observer, and if you've used Rx Java, it then becomes the sort of the similar pattern of um, providing your what what thread you want to subscribe on, observe on, and providing um, callbacks for your on next and on error methods in the subscription. So really if you sort of start with one and move to the other, it's really simple to, uh, to, to switch them over. That's actually how I, how I did this. I, I wrote everything first using live data, and then um, <clears throat> one by one I, I replaced certain method calls with Rx Java, and it's really, really simple. And um, the other nice thing about Rx Java, if you're using that, is that it can, it can handle, it can make it a lot easier to handle the threading for you. So this would just sort of be like, a, I guess, a naive implementation of, of any sort of database threading you might need to do. So, for example, if, if we didn't have this insert reminder wrapped in a, in a new thread, then um, it's, it would, we would get a crash saying, like, hey, you can't do this on the main thread. So, if you're using Rx Java, it's actually quite simple to sort of handle this. So, um, you can uh, sort of create a, a one time sort of Rx Java operation. And using and what it will do is it will do this this method call this insert reminder, and you can say that you want to do it on the background thread, you want to observe on the main thread, and then you just call it. And as any consumer of this method, they have no idea what you're doing. They have no idea that it's doing this threading. As far as they're concerned, they're just I'm inserting a reminder and and I'm I'm done. And the nice thing is, is if you wanted to have callbacks on when things were completed. <clears throat> Um, you could actually include them in the subscribe uh, block. So if you wanted to be notified on a successful insert, then that's something you could do. So um, it just gives you a little more functionality and, and I would argue, a, I, I guess, a little nicer API for certain things such as threading. Obviously, let's talk about testing. Um, so if we sort of go back to um, this test reminder list method, um, with live data, obviously we were sort of hampered by having to call this live data test util but get value method. With Rx Java, it's actually really, really slick. So um, it's basically you just sort of do your same sort of data setup and then you just call the, the method directly, um, this get all reminders, which returns that that uh, the flowable and you call this test method and then you do any sort of assertions that you need to do. And this just comes all out of the box. You don't need to import that live data test util. You don't need to do anything else. This just works um, with with Room and with Arcs Java, which is which is pretty slick. So, uh, should you use live data? Uh, once again, I would say I would say go for it. Um, it's it offers a lot of cool features in the sense that um, you can you're automatically going to get updated on any backing data changes. Um, and it follows sort of this uh, subscriber pattern, which is becoming really, really popular. And um, I found that the nice thing about it too is that you can use both of them side by side. Uh, when I say both of them, I mean live data and Rx Java. So the strategy that I found that worked quite well was that any sort of database operations I was using Rx Java for, um, because it, it allowed for sort of the simple threading and um, allowed for uh, I guess some extra, or just the, the functionality of Rx Java. But if you're, anytime I needed to do anything with data that I controlled that wasn't necessarily from the database, uh, I found myself using live data for that because it was just a little simpler and you didn't need all sort of the baggage that came with Rx Java and um, just sort of really simple and easy to use. So I found in my case that was a good combination and it worked really well for me. So, um, as just sort of a summary on uh, on sort of the architecture, my experience with the architecture components in general, um, it's really nice that we now have a, a lifecycle aware, officially supported architecture, which is something we've never had. So um, really, really handy in that regard. Um, the auto updating of live data is really, really, really nice. So it works. the The benefit of this really, I did, I really sort of noticed it when I had my when I noticed it in my sort of reminder list activity. So you have, um, I would have my list of reminders. I would go and add a new reminder. And when that new reminder was saved to the database, my list was automatically updated without me having to do anything. And when I went back to the main, to the list activity, it was just there, which was amazing because that's something 
that was always something you'd have to do manually before and, and add some code for that. And the nice thing about architecture components is you can use them individually if you want. You don't need to have all three, or, or I guess there's more than just these three that I've talked about, but you don't have to include them all if you don't want to. It's, you can use, if you just want to use room, then go for it. If you just want to use live data and nothing else, like you can. So really, really nice in that regard. And if you don't want to use any of them, that's also fine. Like, as I said, your app's not going to stop working if you don't use them. It's just, it's a way to make Android development a little, little nicer, in my opinion. And as always, just the things to be aware of. You will need to implement some threading for Room in, unless, you're, unless you're using sort of the Rx Java uh, method. Um, the view model provider factory method, which as I mentioned is the way to instantiate a view model with constructor parameters. The documentation for this is, is pretty abysmal um, in the sense that there is none, um, which is odd because this is a really handy feature, but it's, it mentions it like once in the documentation. It doesn't provide any examples on how to use it. And so in order to, to use it, I actually found it through the Google samples. And I've actually ran into a, a, a number of other developers who had no idea you could do this. And it's just not publicized very well. And I'm not quite sure why, because it's, it's a really handy feature. And again, single live events and the live data test utils are not included. So those are things, um, if you want to use them, you're just going to have to import them yourself. Um, not a huge deal, but just something to be aware of. So on the whole, um, if you were to ask me for a recommendation on whether or not you should use architecture components, uh, I would say, yeah, go for it. Um, I think that no, I didn't come across anything that would make me not recommend it. So it's definitely not essential. Um, you can certainly do Android development without it, but they solve a lot of sort of nagging problems that we've been dealing with for a number of years and um, without really all that many drawbacks. So if I was going to start a new project, if I was uh, refactoring an existing project, definitely something I would use because it's, I think it's just going to get more popular and, it's, and as the library advances, there's just going to be more and more things added to it. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's just a, a good way to go. So uh, that's sort of, that was sort of my experience using architecture components. Um, Hope it was helpful. I hope uh, you got some information that um, you're going to be able to take away. Uh, if you want to help uh, with the project, uh, there's the GitHub repo. Um, if you've noticed something I sort of did that you didn't like or you think I could do better, by all means, like tell me or submit a pull request. Um, if you want to rewrite the app, submit a pull request. I'll try not to be super offended, um, but, uh, but by all means. And uh, if you want more info, um, there is a lot of great uh, documentation online about this. I mean, there's, there's hundreds and, of blog posts and things like that, but the, generally speaking, the, the Android documentation for this is quite good. Um, there are some, some gaps, uh, as I mentioned, with this, they don't talk about the view model factory very much for some reason, but um, definitely some good info there. And this right here, I, I can't recommend enough. This is, um, this is uh, a, Google sam a Google repo, or a GitHub repo, with a bunch of samples on how to use architecture components. I think there's five different uh, repos in there. Um, one is just sort of a basic sample on how to use them. One uh, converts everything to Rx Java. One uses Kotlin. Like there's just, it's it basically the same project, just redone in a, in a bunch of different ways, which makes it really easy to see the differences between you know, the different approaches. So can't recommend that enough if you're looking for more information on, um, on architecture components. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.